Good morning and welcome back to another We Are Sunderland Morning Briefing. It is Friday the 12th of April. Um, this morning I'm joined by James Hunter. How are you doing, James? Good morning. How are you doing, Matty? Yeah, spot on. We've got the band back together once again um, <laughs> from the old Chronicle days. Um, before we get stuck into things, um, We Are Sunderland is the place to be for red and white news at the moment. Um, we've got expert uh, opinion, uh, tactical analysis and insight from former players. Uh, we're in partnership with the Fire Museum and Cost Specs Opticians. Now, this morning, um, I don't know if you've seen these these little bottles um, from oh, James. Very, kind of, the, very kind of you. The classic, <laughs> the classic edition. So we've been kind enough to be gifted um, one of those. Um, it's in partnership with Jamesons, um, who are an official partner of the AFL, and in partnership with the away days, sort of, I don't know if you've seen them, they do like retro shirts and things like that, classic football shirts. Um, so we've been kindly gifted um, one of those. And um, they are doing a night at Quinn's Bar um, just to sort of go through, because the shirt in question is the shirt that we gave away um, earlier this week, um, the 1992 FA Cup final shirt. There is a night being held at the Stadium of Light um, at Quinn's Bar. Um, so there's more information over on Sunderland's website, you know, with a QA and a um, with former players. So, for example, Kevin Ball, um, I know Gary Bennett, Gordon Armstrong and Brian Atkinson will be there. Um, it is a ticketed event. So if you are interested, head over there to Sunderland's website and have a look. And I'll just quickly put that down. Well, before we get stuck into things, uh, I'll just quickly touch on the other night at, at Leeds United. I mean, on the face of things, what do you make of that result, James, on, on paper? I was down at Ellen Road and I thought it was it was an improved performance from what we've seen. It did, it, you've got to sort of remain balanced, I think. And yes, it was a really good away display. Um, I think that's the first time Leeds have failed to score at home since September. Um, it's the first time I think they've failed to score since December, if I'm right. So pretty good statistics on that side of things they did have good opportunities at the other end I thought Sunderland had three shots on target obviously to, to lead as one I thought those shots were in large the best the better chances but they still they weren't overly brilliant but I think you've got to take stock of just where Sunderland are at the moment um what did you make of that result haven't haven't sort of watched it yeah well um I mean, there are goalless straws and there are goalless straws, aren't there? Um, and I think that um, going to Ellen Road when Leeds are, are fighting for automatic promotion and they've just dropped out of, well, you know, they did drop out of the Premier League, um, going there, restricting Leeds to to one shot on target throughout 90 minutes, uh, coming away with a point and a, and a clean sheet um, is in isolation, you know, a very good result. Um, it's a, 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 a good disciplined defensive performance um but of course in in the broader picture the the wider context Sunderland have won one game in 11 and um yeah. you know that as a whole is is you know nowhere near good enough um but I think that the Leeds game in isolation was was an improvement um it proved that uh Sunderland haven't forgotten how to defend um yeah. obviously the the clean sheet against Leeds and coming on the back of the clean sheet at the weekend against Bristol City. Um, obviously, prior to that, there'd been the, the 5-1 um, uh, implosion at, at the Stadium of Light against um, Blackburn Rovers. So I think coming coming back with two clean sheets has, um, you know, certainly, uh, you know, certainly at least proved that Sunderland haven't forgotten how to defend. And uh, at times in that game against Blackburn, uh, it, it definitely looked like they had. Um, forgotten how to defend so so there yeah. were positives to take from that Leeds game definitely yeah I think one of those is is the four clean sheets and five isn't it I know we spoke just quickly before we sort of came on and said that if you look at the games in isolation you can sort of pick um, pieces apart and you can sort of see where um, you know you can understand not the excuses but you can understand some of the the reasoning behind it can't you Um there has been individual factors in those games, but as you say, that that run of form in general hasn't been good enough, has it? I mean, you look at, I think it's widely accepted, um, you know, that that QPR game before the international break was not good enough. It finished nil-nil. They didn't have a shot on target. They then responded with a win against Cardiff, which again is is the only win in that time. Um, you've got the Southampton defeat. You've, 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 you can sort of see they fought their way back to 2-2. Two -two. There's glimmers in, and I think Mike Dodds keeps referring to it as, as patches that he's that he's been pleased with. But on the whole, um, 
you know, it's it's difficult to to get on the, on a bandwagon too much, isn't it? I mean, as what as we say there, in isolation, that is a very good point at Leeds United. But when it's on the back of everything that's come from, I'm not going to be overly negative because again, I think you take that result any any part of the season, regardless of when or or where Leeds are, are challenging. I think if you go down to Ellen Road on the first game of the season, you'd take a draw there, wouldn't you? So it it as you say there, it it's a it's a pretty strange time. Um one win in six doesn't set the world alight, but they have shown signs, I think. Again, it's is the Blackburn game an anomaly, do you think? Um, or, or do you think that that sort of, I don't know, highlighted the problems that, that are there? Yeah, well, it was an anomaly in, insofar as um, you know conceding five goals at home. Uh, it's only the third time it's happened at the yeah. Stadium of Light. And I think it's only the fourth time um, in about 40 years, um, you know, on Wayside. So, so it's an anomaly in that sense. But, but when you look at the, the course of the season, Sunderland have just, the form has fallen off a cliff really since about New Year's Day um, yeah. after the after the win against Preston on, on New Year's Day. Uh, up to that point, um, they were uh, competitive and looking to um, push on and, and get in that top six. Um, results started to fade away. Um, they, um, they still were up and around the top six, within reach of that top six, probably until about mid-February. And then it really started to to slide, um, and and now of course they find themselves in, in mid table. Um, so when you look at, at any result, yes, individual results like the Leeds result, like the Cardiff result, you can look at those and you can find positives yeah. in in those. But um, but as a whole, the results just haven't been been good enough. Haven't been anywhere near good enough for uh, either in comparison to to last season, which was some of them were obviously trying to uh, emulate and, and improve upon. Um, or you know, for for this season in in and of itself, um, so there are a lot of lessons that the club need to learn this um, from this season and uh, and use those next season to uh, to improve and, and move a step forward. We just had a message through there from Martin. Thanks everyone who's <coughs> who's message so far. He's watching on in Turkey. Well, put it this way, Martin. I'd rather be where you are, where where hopefully the sun is shining. Um, but as you say there, comparing it to, to last season, that's always going to be the you know the, the 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 sort of stick in the sand to compare to, isn't it? I mean, especially if we sort of bring things in in a round circle to to the game this weekend, the trip to West Brom last season with Dennis Serkin's brace, and it was one of the final few games. I think it's almost exactly a year since since they last went down there. That felt like a real sort of catalyst for the final sort of push. That that effectively got Sunderland over the line. You you were there that day. Yeah. There's been such a huge sort of change in 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 mood and, and and feeling around the place. I mean looking back to that day, I mean, do do you remember, I don't know, the the sort of feeling around the squad? There was a real feel good feeling at that time, wasn't there? There was. Um Sunderland were in a bit of a role. I'm trying to remember, as I said as I said to you before we we started, sometimes um it can be difficult to to recall individual games. Um, I think Sunderland were on uh, in the midst of what ended up a, a sort of a, a nine-game unbeaten run, was it, at the end of that season, something, something yeah. like that, to go into the playoffs. Um, and uh, Sunderland uh, went to West Brom. West Brom were one of the teams on that day that were, you know, had had genuine top six aspirations of, of their own. And I can remember the look on the faces of the other journalists in the um, uh, in the press room at the Hawthorns at full time. I, you know, it was a catastrophic result as far as their um, yeah. hopes um, hopes were concerned uh, and it pushed Sunderland back into the top six um, and obviously um, that was where the, where they ended up uh, um, in the final analysis. It was a very important game. It, Sunderland came from behind that day. I think they, they fell behind <clears throat> to um, uh, was it a penalty I think on the yeah, score half time? Yeah. Swift, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And um, and obviously two goals from Dennis Serkin in the second half turn turned things round. Um, so it was a real sort of statement from Sunderland. They were, despite falling behind, they did not um, capitulate. They didn't uh, feel sorry for themselves. They came back, got on terms, and then ultimately uh, um, won the game. And and it was that kind of spirit that the that the club had at that time that that refusal to be beaten. Um, that really carried them over the line and, and, and saw them finish that, that season in sixth place. 
Yeah, it's interesting as well. I'll just quickly run through the team from that day. So you had Patterson, Gooch at right back, Hume at centre half, or nine centre half, Cirque and left back, Neil and Ekwa in the middle, Diallo, Barr, Clark, and Gelhart up top. Now, as much as we've spoken about Sunderland's injury issues this year, and it is, of course, fair to talk about, Trey Hume actually started that game at centre half. So it's not as if Tony Mowbray went into that run of fixtures. Was there some good fortune to it? I suppose you could either argue both ways. But it's. It, you know the 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 players that I've listed there. That it's nearly half a team. That's that's different. I mean, Dennis Sirkin has, has hardly played this season, and I know we've spoken to Mike Dodds, etc. He's been a big miss, hasn't he? Uh, yeah, he has. He's he's been a, a huge miss. Um, you know, the, they've they've not managed to to have their first choice players. Um, certainly in that left back position. Um, more recently, there's been Leo Hjelda playing there, who is not a left back by any stretch of the imagination. He's done a job in there. Obviously, Adji Elise can yeah. uh, can play there, but he's only recently come back from from injury. Um, uh, Niall Huggins has played there, but he's been out long term yeah. for, with injury. So, so they really have been short of um, of a, a natural left back uh, all season with uh, Dennis Serkin's injury. That's been a huge problem. Um, but I know that, that Sunderland have got a long injury list now. I mean, it's just just starting to, to clear one one or two players coming back, of course. But um, you know, in, there has been a, a long catalogue of injuries. But there were plenty of injuries last season as yeah. well. Um, you know, the, off the top of my head, from the team that you just read out, I mean, there's no Agielis in there, no Corey Evans yeah. in there, no Ross Stewart in there. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, the, there's a huge. I don't think was was Dan Ballard mentioned on that team. Uh, I, don't, no. I don't think so. He was missing in that game for for um, whatever reason. Um, so so there were plenty of players missing last season. Um, and Tony Mowbray had to his little uh, phrase was you know have to find a way and and yeah. that's what Sunderland have had to try and do this season as well. Um, unfortunately, they haven't been able to find a way. Um, so you know that that seems to be the the key difference between this season and last. Um, Sunderland managed to find a way last season, and, and they haven't done um, all too often this time. Yeah, I think when I've just obviously compared the last five um, games from the two sides, Sunderland and West Brom, I think Sunderland have picked up six points from five. West Brom have picked up nine points from five. But if you look at West Brom's sort of run of form over the last ten games, the run beaten, so. I mean, that sort of epitomises a Carlos Corberan side, doesn't it? I mean, they're very difficult to to beat. We saw when they finished in the playoffs with Huddersfield that he, they don't concede very many goals. And that's a similar sort of case for West Brom. I think, if I just quickly double-check the table, they're on 72 points, Norwich on 68. I mean, I think uh, Coventry in seventh. Obviously, they've got a game in hand on West Brom. But a win for West Brom against Sunderland could and probably should all but secure their playoff um, sort of hope, aspirations for, for the end of the season. I mean, if we quickly touch on that top sort of six, Leicester, Ipswich, Leeds, Southampton, West Brom, and at the moment it's Norwich. That is a very competitive top six, isn't it? Um, you've got... I, I was listening to the What The Fall podcast and they were talking about, obviously, the, the teams that have come down. And... This is the first real season where I think that all three Premier League sides who have come down have made a real sort of fist of things at the top. Obviously, Ipswich are maybe a bit of an anomaly, but they've obviously put some money behind what they're doing this season. But it, it is the first real season where you feel like that's the top four has been in sort of le a league of their own, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Um, of course, um, you know, Ipswich are the uh, Ipswich are, are the exception in there, having been the team that's come out of League One. Um, and that would no, Ipswich are having the season this season that that you know Sunderland would have dreamed of coming straight out yeah. of League One and immediately challenging promotion to the Premier League. Um, so they, they've done an incredible job, but obviously they've been uh, operating on a on a large budget and they can't afford to fail if they don't win promotion either automatically or um, uh, or via the playoffs. Um, then there's going to be there's going to be a reckoning at Portman Road um, because they've uh, they've uh, um, spent an awful lot of money um, and how they sustain that is uh, going to be very very interesting. Um, but as far as the the other teams, you know, Southampton, Leeds, and and Leicester are concerned, um, yeah, they they really have um, sort of swept swept the league for for long periods. I mean, Leicester were were way out in front and have been sort of uh, hauled back. 
Um, Leeds have started fairly tamely, but have, have you know kept rising and rising and rising, and they're right up there now. So you've sort of got Leicester, Leeds, and uh, and Ipswich um, vying for the two automatic promotion places, and then immediately behind them you've got Southampton. So um, I think I think Southampton. I, I can't remember how many points Southampton have got now, but I think that they're probably not in the conversation real realistically for uh, automatic promotion. Is that, is that right? I'm... Yeah, they're on seventy eight, but they've got two games in hand. I think Leeds are in third right, okay. with with eighty seven. So I mean, they've got very slight sort yeah. of hopes of getting in there, but it'd be quite quite a bit big ask. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, they've got they've got a, an opportunity, but they can't. Um, you know, there's not there's no margin for error for Southampton. They're more likely going to end up in in the playoffs along with one of those three that we that we just talked about. So that's two of your playoff places accounted for already. Um, and then you know West Brom um, and Norwich at the moment, but there's a big chasing pack not far yeah. from uh, not far behind. So yeah, it, it's fascinating. It's a fascinating battle. The shape of it is very much like uh, like last season. Isn't it where you you've got um, you've got a race for for the automatic yeah. promotion, then you've got a couple of teams that are well established in the playoffs, and then you've got you know a group of teams that are trying to get those uh, those last couple of playoff places, um, and some of them were were obviously um, uh, the team that that um, booked their place on the last day of the season last season. Um, so it is, it's a fascinating thing, but you can you can see that at the top of the, the championship now, just as, as everybody always expected, um, the money yeah. and the budget from the from the teams that have dropped down from the Premier League means that means that they are you know almost literally in a class of their own. Yeah, I think if you look back at the players that Leicester sold, obviously Madison, I think if you put just him. The value of him, I think, was a fifty million something like that. That's almost more than Sunderland's entire squad is probably worth. Now, that's not a slight on Sunderland. That's just the reality of the situation of where they've come from. But again, if we sort of go back to earlier this season when they played West Brom, as you say, there you touched on at the start of this sort of show, Sunderland were right in the playoff picture at that point, and then wins over Leeds and West Brom it sort of felt like a bit of a statement, didn't it, at the time to be like, oh well. Maybe they can, maybe they can sort of have a repeat of last season. Maybe they can go one further. It hasn't panned out that way since then. No, it hasn't. Um, I mean, obviously, the the wins over Leeds and West Brom um, came under Mike Dodds, uh, yeah. back to back wins in the space of a few days at the Stadium of Light in in December. Um, and at that time, I mean, those were two games, two very very difficult um, home games, and. Uh, to to win both and to to come away with two clean sheets and two victories in those two games, uh, really that I think that that played a big part in at that time at that point in December, um, changing fan perceptions of Mike Dodds um, yeah. when he was initially when he was initially put in in charge when Tony Mowbray was sacked, um, a lot of people um, you know understandably um were were pretty fearful about what might happen because they remembered his previous um spelling case caretaker charge when uh, um uh, in league 1 when when Sunderland had lost against Cheltenham and against yeah. uh, whoever else it, it was was it Doncaster I can't remember whoever it was anyway yeah. it was um it, it were teams at, at the very bottom of the uh, um at the table and um and People thought, "Oh, here we go again." But those two games and those two performances at the stadium of like really made people think twice and think, "All right, okay." Um, and in fact, there was there was even some people at that time saying, "Well, you know, on the back of those results, um, wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to stick with Mike Dodds for for a while, because yeah. Sunderland were up there, they were, they were challenging. I mean, they weren't far away um, from the playoff places when Tony Mowbray was sacked, which is one of the many reasons why that was such an incomprehensible decision." Um, in and of itself, I can't remember off the top of my head with the three or four points outside the top top six. Then they, they weren't far behind anyway. They were within touching distance of the of the top six. Um, but as we've seen since then, as as I mentioned earlier on, from the turn of the year, obviously Michael Beale then being installed um, uh, in December um, on, under Michael Beale's watch, the form started to tail off, and really Mike has been unable to arrest that since he came. Came in 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 the middle of uh, uh, in middle of February time. So um, yeah, it's been it's been very very tough, and it's been sad to see 
uh, Sunderland's chances slide. It's come along alongside that backdrop of injuries, which of course haven't haven't helped. But Sunderland aren't the only team with injuries. You know, the, the you know too much can be made of that. I think at times, yes, they've got a bad in, injury uh, uh, record, but so have other teams. And Sunderland have had bad injury records before. And you, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to uh, you know battle through it. Yeah. Um, I think just as I touched on earlier, obviously this game this weekend, it's it's another tough one, isn't it? It's West Brom have got plenty to play for with, as I said there, they can almost all but mathematically secure their place, I think, in the top six um, with a win over Sunderland this weekend. Sunderland, nothing to play for, but I suppose you'd be encouraged by the the sort of the performance at, at Ellen Road heading into this weekend. Yeah, um, of course. I mean... <sighs> Sunderland are going to need another kind of performance like that. Certainly defensively, they're going to need to be disciplined yeah. and keep keep their shape. Um, and they're going to need to throw bodies in, in the way of the ball. The the big question, of course, they proved they can do that against uh, against Leeds and, and in other games um, recently, they've kept clean sheets. The big question is, what are they going to do at the other end? How are they going to yeah. um, create chances? How are they going to give themselves uh, an opportunity to win the game? That's what they need. Um, of course, having Jack Clark back in the starting eleven, um, you know, is, is a important boost for them. They've had that in the last two games, but against Bristol City and Leeds, they haven't managed to score. But at least with Jack Clark being being back in, in the side for, for these last two games, and I assume injury permitting, fingers fingers crossed, um, it'll be starting again this weekend at, uh, at West Brom. Um, you can you can tell, even though they haven't scored in those last two games, as I mentioned, um, there is definitely uh, they look a more of a potent threat. He carries yeah, the ball. He gives he gives teams something to worry about. He, he gives them better balance. Um, the you know the, the issue. I mean, you know, we, how many times have we discussed it? Is it so it's a weekly event, isn't it? The, the, there's just nothing um, up, up front. There's just nothing um, and. You know, we've talked about it so many, so many times. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure that, that fans must get tired of us banging on about it, but that is the nub of the issue. That That is, um, you know, the, the biggest single factor in, in why Sunderland are 13th in the table and not, you know, 6th, 7th, 5th, yeah. you know, somewhere around there. I mean, it's interesting. Again, Mike Dodds actually mentioned it again in his, um, I think it was pretty much press conference ahead of, um, obviously, the trip to Leeds, he said he would like more options in that area. And I think it's now, as you've said in, in the piece that you've done this morning over on We Are Some, and you can subscribe for £1 for six months and unlock that. Um, so I won't give it too much away, but obviously you've touched on that over there, saying that <clears throat> there's a bit of an acceptance now. I certainly feel like there is from those above that this year, maybe it's just been too young. Um, I suppose the frustrating thing is, is that in the summer and January, they didn't, really look to assess, sort of address that, sorry. I mean, the argument that Callum Styles has played over 100 appearances at this age, this, this, the championship, I mean, he's still only, what, 23, 24. Can you say he's experienced? Mm, I, I don't really think you can. Um, that's just my personal opinion, but I think it's certainly an area that they need to address, isn't it, in the summer? It is, and and I think that they will ad address it, You know, as I mentioned in, in that piece. I just think that the, that the club would would benefit um, by um, being more communicative with with yeah. fans. That's kind of the topic that I've that I've addressed um, in the column today. Um, I, th I think that they should they should be more accepting of the failings rather than le leave fans wondering what's going to happen in in the summer. Will the club bring in you know more experienced players? Will the club um, you know what direction will the club go um, in terms of head coach? Um, why not talk about it now? Talk about your plans. Let plans in. Let fans in on on the plan. Um, don't have to ne mention names. I'm not expecting them to come out and say we're yeah. signing this player, this player, and this player, and that's going to be our new head coach. Um, but just tell fans what what they what they can expect. And I think that that fans would respect that more. Um, I think they would. Uh, you know, I think it would do the the powers that be at Sunderland. You know, no harm to for them to you know, publicly uh, you know acknowledge that. Uh, that they have got the balance wrong this season. Uh, I think everybody can see it. So why not say it? You know, hold your hands up. Say we've got we've got the uh, the balance wrong this season, and we're going to put that right next season. I think that would give 
um, fans uh, optimism and, and hope that something's going to be done to address this. The worry for fans is that when there's sort of stony silence from from the club, yeah. um, you, fans fans think to themselves, well, do they realise they've got this wrong or do they think everything's just fine? Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, uh, is there going to be a change of direction or are they just going to keep, keep on with more of the same? Um, you know, I do think that they'll tweak tweak things this yeah this, um and uh and if that is the case then the, it'll do the club no harm at all to, to say so and if the club isn't going to tweak things if the club does think that this is fine and and there's nothing to worry about and everything's under control then come out and and justify that decision to fans too um you know say so and and explain why um you know i, I just think that, that the communication could be better yeah certainly that's something that i've said in, the, in sort of months gone by um just to echo those thoughts i mean especially when you know mike dodds and co were going through that run where they didn't they, they didn't pick up a win prior to cardiff it, it it makes life difficult for him as well because then he's as far as we're away we'll drop back down into the first team and, and be a coach again so you're then sort of not tarnish from reputations but you're not doing anything to protect people um sort of like Mike Dodd. So obviously we've had a couple of, of comments through. Um some of them just announced that the partnership with with Hummel for next season. Um if you add Ellen Road, obviously they've done a few there's a few stickers sort of went up um around Ellen Road with a QR code. Um so they've got a multi year partnership with um Hummel which will start. Um they've said it's a five year term um sort of deal which is one of the largest commercial deals in the club's history, which is good news. Um, so as we said there, look, Hummel made one of the the kits, um, the 1992 kit. So that's promising heading into next season. Um, we'll we'll draw a line under things um, just in a in a second, um, just because obviously we've got the press conference coming up shortly. Um, but yeah, what well, what do you make of it? I, I don't normally tend to to sort of go in the way of of, of making guesses or, or predictions for for how I think the result will go this weekend. But how do you think Mike Dodds will sort of line up? Because it's it's an interesting talking point because he's gone to a back five at Leeds. He went to a back five against Leicester and that was one of their better performances, albeit they didn't get the result. It's something that he did in his first spell. Um, do you think that Sunderland squad at the moment sort of like lends in, into that? Um, well, obviously it wasn't built to play that way. Um, yeah. It was built to play... A, you know, for a four-two-three-one, that was the uh, the original vision. And I know that um, uh, uh, how shall I put it? Um, Tony Mowbray was discouraged from playing five at the back. That wasn't it. Wasn't the um, the wish of of, um, uh, of of the club to 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 play in that system and shape? Now, when Mike Dodds was was in temporary charge in December. Um, he was given license to use five at the back if that was what he wanted to do, if he thought that was the right thing to do. And he did use it and it worked to, to good effect, as we as we mentioned, against Leeds. And I think they did it against West Brom from memory as well, did they, in, in December? You'll remember better than me, probably, Matty. But, um, but yeah, they certainly did that in uh, in December and it worked to, to good effect. Um, having worked again um, this time, uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if they... If they play five at the back down down there, um, uh, they can't afford to to go down there and and defend as they did against Blackburn. Um, so it might be a case of trying trying to keep it tight with a you know that strong defensive shape and and nick a goal. But they've got to try and find a way to create more um, than they did at Leeds. Um, uh, how they do that? How uh, you know how you adjust the balance, turn the dial slightly. Um, so that you've got a little bit more attacking threat, but without losing your defensive solidity, is of course you know one of those great uh, you know footballing conundrums. It's uh, easy to say, yeah. not so easy to do. Yeah, there's an interesting debate to be had over on the right hand side of the pitch as well, because um, Chris Rigg has obviously played there, um, sort of drifting in field and rolling in field, and he found decent pockets of space at Ellen Road. But obviously, Patrick Roberts is now back fit. Abdullah Bars dropped out of the squad. He was back in it for Leeds. There's sort of a at the moment. There's there's a real sort of battle for, for that right hand side there. And I think there's a couple of players that can that can stake a claim there. Those mentioned you've got Romain Mundell who can also play over on that side. It feels like at the moment that I mean at, at the minute that that Chris Rigg has that that slot. But given his age, they don't want to overexpose him to that. Um 
what what do you think? I mean, I, I would just going off the last season, I think Patrick Roberts would tend to be the first name on that sheet, but it hasn't he hasn't sort of hit the heights that he has last season, this season, has he? No, no, he hasn't. And um, you know, that's been one of the, the biggest differences, isn't it, this season to, to last. Um he wasn't performing particularly well at the start of the season, then he spent a long period out injured and he's only just recently come back. So um, we haven't seen this season Patrick Roberts at his best at any stage of, yeah. of this season. Um, so, yeah, you've got different options down, down that side. Um, I don't know whether, um, I don't know how many times they will want to expose Chris Rigg in a sh- short space of yeah. space of time, whether they'll, they'll want to keep him there, whether they'll think at, at 16, um, that's asking too much of, of a, a young lad. Um so, so they may well make, make the change. I mean, Patrick Roberts is the is the natural call, the easy call. He's the, ex, yeah. the mo- most experienced man. He's the he's the guy that's been there and seen it, and he's the guy that that can um, unlock defenses when when he's at his best. Um, and Romain Mundell's a little bit of a wild card, really, isn't he? He's mm-hmm. still yeah. uh, still settling in. He's still he's still um, searching for for his best role and and see exactly how um, Sunderland are going to get the best out of him and where they're going to use him. Um, so they have got options down down that side. My own my own belief, um, I think that they'll probably probably go with um, uh, probably go with Patrick um, yeah. down at West Brom. That's sort of like the tried and tested um, thing. But of course, it all hinges on as we were saying. It all hinges on what shape Mike Dodds is going to yeah. play because that'll have a big influence as well of which of those three players that we just mentioned, which of those is most appropriate down that side. Yeah, thanks again for joining me this morning, James. Brilliant as usual. Thanks to those of you who've got your comments in. It's it's made for great talking points. Um, so we are Sunderland, the place to be for everything red and white, tactical analysis, exclusive interviews and insight from former players. It's still just £1 to subscribe over on our website. If you haven't yet, make sure you head over there. Um, if you subscribe on YouTube as well, that would be a massive help. As, as plenty of people have done this morning, drop your comments in. Like, if you share the video as well, that'd be a great help. Thanks for joining us this morning, and I'm about to head off to Mike Dodds' press conference. So, catch you all next week.